Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beauties for some more global power rankings. And it's been, we missed a week of these, so we're not going to have the arrows for team switching, comparing where they were last week, because there's such big changes in some of these spots because it's been two weeks and most of that was a playoff run in the LEC. It's a combination of a couple of things, as you as you outlined right there. The LEC playoff run, a little bit of a gap in between the regions. You know, LCS having a little bit of a break before, the lunar break that we're coming off of. And then we've had some pretty rapid swifts and, and swings of things in the LPL and some LCK teams rising up as well. That's where you're going to get a lot of this movement. Way too much movement to do the arrows. We're starting fresh. This is the new power. Two squads, barely. And I mean fingernails only, holding on to this top 20 are Cloud9 and LNG. C9, again, it's been a week since we saw LCS squads, but they had the win against NRG and then the incredible throw against 100 Thieves. But it should have been a 2-0, still enough for this team to have one toe on the mountain of top 20. Enough for to hang in there just at the bare the, the entry limit line to get into this power rankings is Cloud9 in that number 20 spot and really is one where we're still waiting to see this really hit the full strides that we want to be talking about. I think we had the early, you know, first week and getting all that, you know, hype about it. And, you know, we'd waited to see this move with Jojo coming into the team and how things would play out for them. You step into where we are now in the split and what we've seen, I think a lot of it isn't necessarily about Jojo Pyun. Sure, there has been some individual whoopsies and mistakes from him that we can talk about, but I'm more so uh, looking at that bottom lane, looking at how Berserker and Vulcan are pairing up. A lot of people wanting to put this individually on Berserker, but I think that's the wrong way to look at what's been going on or what necessarily hasn't been going right. What has been, hasn't been going right in that bottom lane has been the lack of communication, chemistry, and deciding on that play style. I think that change from what Zven was to what Vulcan represents in the bottom lane, Vulcan's own individual performance, I think is another thing that could be looked at as where that thing's going wrong in that bottom lane. For Cloud9, enough is steady with that win against NRG that you hold them into this spot, but they're going to have to start really putting it together and showing us what a lot of people envisioned around the hype in the offseason. People probably didn't envision a two and four start for this LNG squad that has so many returning members from where they were contenders going five games against JDG last year, had the matchup against FPX and I mean, okay, FPX looked good, but LNG have I know they had a really tough schedule and we were forgiving them, so they're still barely holding on because they've already played BLG and JDG. Uh, but shout outs to Milky Way on FPX. One of the dopest names in the LPL also, but this rookie jungler, he looks legit. Milky Way and Care, that mid jungle duo, making sure that it is good stuff happening for Fun Plus Phoenix. FPX getting back into this conversation it's been a little bit since they've been around hanging out and towards these teams that you should be paying attention to knowing about in the lpl but i think we can throw this year's edition up there you know of course doc thumb someone that we were familiar with in the lck is over now they're uh, performing for the adc role this is certainly going to be one of those squads i want to keep an eye on rising through possibly that dark horse label we love to talk about when it comes time for playoffs in the lpl it doesn't matter if you've been underperforming or in a slump Korean Ezreals just always hit different even if you're over in the LPL that power level translating over for Doc Dom and life in that bot lane the other side of that cloud nine comeback is the team who survived it a hundred thieves quietly got a four game win streak which is the longest in the LCS and I think this team is better faster than we were expecting Yes, it is. And this is one of those ones where it, I think this is one of the most positive surprises for a lot of people. This this early look at the at spring split for the LCS and seeing where this 100 Thieves team has developed into and what they can possibly represent as a challenge to the teams towards the top end of the LCS. And hey, things keep going right. Things keep improving. The potential keeps showing itself for this 100 Thieves team. They could be one of those very top teams in the LCS. General Sniper, I think he got a great you know, start to the year right now and he's continuing to show that, but I want to keep 
striking while the iron's hot and keep improving, keep pushing it in that top side. I think there was a great little piece by the LCS having the players talk and everything else. And Whippo kind of gave him a little bit of a dress down about how to be a pro and how to practice and take things better type of thing in your solo queue environment. I'd love to see a little bit of that implemented and see those results out there on that LCS stage. Yeah. Whippo was calling out and firing strays at everybody in the LCS. Didn't matter if they were just top laners. Uh, ahead of 100 Thieves, Weibo Gaming haven't played since the Lunar Break, so they're next on the schedule for the LPL, so they're sitting pretty in that 16 spot. Then we get to these pair of LEC squads, BDS and Fnatic, and they share a common bond of losing to Mad Lions Koi in Game 5 dramatic fashion. Now, Fnatic... A more of a heartbreaking loss because just a, a brain dead moment uh, in terms of macro is all that separated them from advancing to the next round. It was a game five, and a lot of the times we see game fives be either very one sided, quickly over type of thing, you know, almost the exact opposite of everything in that series leading up to that point, or you do get one of these close ones all the way through, and that's what it felt like. Madeline Squad versus Fnatic until you have that one team fight go very cleanly the way of Madeline's Koi and they push all the way through and that's the game that's the series it's over I think a lot of things you can look at in that series and see the positives that we talked about for both of these teams heading into it unfortunately it is that crucial and costly mistake on the side of Fnatic that derails their plans and BDS side of things I think perform better than you could have hoped for for losing your star top laner in Adam right before this series, Gen X comes in and how about that Lee Sin game? He was popping off, uh, but obviously game five, it was Bad Lions running away with it. But BDS in a tough circumstance performed super well. I think we got to see pretty much almost everything and then some from BDS that you wanted to see from this group of four that is the core that is there alongside Adam. Adam obviously not in, taken out for behavioral issues. This is something that we wanted to see with this type of situation, this type of pressure. Can you step up? Can you really show us that we have made improvements, that you are a stronger group than you were last time out? What we saw at the World Championship event, and I think you did get that from all four of them, showing that type of progression, showing that individually they are contributing more to being a top-level team in the European region. I think there is still something to be said for the type of player power and what he represents and the dynamic for BDS, a player like Adam, but certainly positive signs at the very least from these four and very necessary ones given the situation. FlyQuest dropped the game to Shopify Rebellion as they are the absolute blue shell of the LCS, but still slowly separating themselves from the rest of the LCS pack as that top dog in North America. Yeah, Bwipo has been exactly what we wanted to see from Bwipo up in that top side, what we talked about so many times last year, what he could offer to the LCS, to one of these teams, and not having an opportunity. So getting this one feels very double thumbs up on that one from the Bwipo front. Inspired, dominating. How is anyone letting this guy get Diego in 2024? Did I don't understand. Did you see the clip against Misfits? Do you see this guy walk into the stage with a damn Viego tattoo? He's got a tattooed on his body. How are you letting him pick it in draft? I don't understand that one. Jensen is a player where I think has been better than a lot of people's expectations were heading into this year, coming off of a down year with Dignitas. Still room for improvement individually. And then you go down to that bottom lane of Maso and Masu and Busio, and I have been really impressed with them. I think we waited a little bit to see Masu really start to pop off, really take over in that bottom lane. But him alongside Busio has been a great pair and is showing strides growing each and every week. Yeah, Busio looking legit like the best support in North America through the first half of regular season action. If you're talking about Dark Horses, look no further than the final two squads on this list. You're talking Ninjas in Pajamas and the Kwang Dong Freaks. NIP, I know 5 and one start looks real hot, like we should be super excited about this squad. They've had a pretty damn easy schedule, that lone loss coming to JDG, obviously a squad much higher up in the rankings, but you can't punish them for having an easy schedule, even though it hasn't been some of the cleanest wins. I still think this is a team that potentially could make a run in playoffs. I think so too, and I think a lot of people, what we've been waiting to see obviously is that higher tier of competition for this type of squad together. 
when you're looking at the things that you would expect to see from this Ninjas in Pajama squad, of course, number one is going to be Rookie performing in that mid lane, really taking the strides that you want to be seeing performing at that veteran level. You got that check mark, of course, but then you're looking at, you know, players like Aki, looking at Shanji, what they can do for this team in this opportunity. And I think both of them are showing their, their progression as a professional player from where we last saw them with OMG, seeing this type of move up, seeing them get this hot start. Keep an eye on this squad alongside FPX, one of these rising squads in the LPL. And I feel like from game to game, you see people going from rookie is absolutely washed to rookie the go, even in a single game to game series. Bro, people get reminded that people, even you want a, a higher example, that people, oh, on in the bottom lane, people have yeah. already forgotten about the times he's dominating and popping off the top level squads he's been on in the LPL, reminding people he's still got that skill to contend at a top level. The other LPL squad that we were talking about, okay, four and one start, but they've had a pretty easy schedule. I'm not going to be taking them easily, uh, seriously. And then all of a sudden, IG shows up on the Rift post Lunar New Year and decides to 2 0 smack BLG for their first loss of the split. Leanne picks up double MVPs on Brand and Graves of all champions, and he's styling on Jun on Kindred, his best pick. What happened? Oh my goodness, the IG revolution, it's here for the LPL once again. Just look at your cl clock, look at your calendar, whatever it's got to be. You can figure it out. It's going to come around every now and then. The IG renaissance of the LPL, they are here and they are ready to be a challenging team. One of these other ones that I, I, I hesitate with that Dark Horse label because they might even prove themselves to be outside of that territory of a dark horse right now is how high we are feeling about this IG roster. You're seeing a lot of these young players develop and really start to again, show those strides, the progression in their career. You should know me in the top side, of course, a player that we always like and you know, I love that attitude with him, but really it's been about Leanne in the jungle has really stepped up and really been one of the premier junglers in the LPL to start out this spring split. And the YSKM stocks took a serious nose dive last year but now you're picking camille and having a solid performance head to head against ben okay maybe it's time to start reinvesting in that ig hype as yeah they hang out now at five and one and in the top 10 on these rankings not enough to jump over mad lions koi who oh my god mark they had a hell of a playoff run and hearing the crowd Throughout this playoff run, I feel like you even heard the level up for G2 fans in these finals. I've never heard them cheer for G2 that loudly. Which again, and I don't want to inflate the ego of, of Carmine Corp anymore, but I think that their introduction and as long alongside Mad Lions Koi really going down this full, you know, Spanish type of route, really finding that type of passion, that type of crowd support, and has pushed the other more traditional fan bases of the LEC to match that type of energy, not to be outclassed on the day is something to bring in. These Mad Lions Koi, these members, these four young players alongside the veteran and El Yoya getting it done in these playoffs, really showing it. Of course, Merwin, we've talked so much about how he is a different player, different meta up in the top side. We love that. Praskawi in the mid lane was really crucial alongside El Yoya, his partner in crime, but then that bottom lane duo, your boys down there, in the, in the bottom lane really are the ones I find contributing, providing that firepower of Supa, really making sure he is a difference maker at this LEC level. A lot of people, ourselves included, had doubts about this run for Mad Lions, this you know type of path and trust in El Yoya taking on that leadership role. And I think we've seen that pay off not only on the Rift so far, but in how I'm feeling about their potential for the rest of the year, how they can grow and how much stronger and better this team can be. I think the, the ceiling's the limit for them. And, you know, Friscawi was the guy, I think, that had the biggest question mark heading into this playoff run. And he absolutely showed up in pretty much every single one of these series. The momentum was fully there. And this these guys remain the most exciting team to watch in the LEC. Obviously, things coming up short against G2 in those finals. But, I mean, G2, they're just a different beast right now. Caps, it's actually becoming ludicrous how many titles this guy has. It's insane. You can't count them. You can't count them. I don't want to see it. I know you can count them, but I don't want to hear Double it. digits now we're getting to, man. 
you're getting pretty crazy with someone like Caps in the mid lane, but that's just what G2 does. G2 rolling on through as the spring, as the spring winter, excuse me, getting all my splits uh, jumbled up because of the LEC. But the winter split champions, Caps taking it alongside his teammates. And it was really something where I think the challenge was there from the Mad Line score. They have certainly raised up their level. It just was that G2 was on another stratosphere heading through these playoffs and what they were able to do, the type of flexibility that they have right now in the meta and their champion pools. It's too much. LCK little flip we had with KT and Hanwha Life, and it was pretty easy to grade it when you saw both of them match up against Gen G. Hanwha Life gets 2 0 pretty convincingly by Gen G, and KT comes up with the full rollster coaster upset in a 2 0 takedown of Gen G. That was maybe the most surprising series of the whole week. Was certainly the surprising one for me. I do want to give a little bit of caution and say that the Gen G answer to that KT series was the Hanwha Life series. So it yeah, they certainly looked angry was, for sure. Yes, that bounce back and looking to maybe say, I know that this is, you know, Mr. Peanut, you're looking for that revenge victory, that little one against our friends here, but uh -oh. we can't be letting that one slide. Not on this day. It was Gen G returning to that type of form. But what we have seen from both Hot and Life and KT is they're going to be in that picture. They're going to be in that conversation, whatever it is, top four of the LCK. I think a squad, you know, as you alluded to a little bit earlier, Kwong Dong Freaks is kind of hanging around there, making it interesting. They might jump into that picture in the LCK. But for now, feel comfortable with teams uh, like Hanwha Life, like KT Rolster holding on to this spot. And I think at least for KT Rolster, they might say, we don't want to hold on to this spot. We want to hold on to one of the top spots in the LCK. I mean, they're almost always competitive against T1 in that matchup. We just saw them take down Gen G, and yeah, they do look a cut above that three to five, six area in the LCK. So absolutely, we're definitely not getting excited, but KT has another solid week, even followed it up with a win against DRX. You thought for sure that was one they were gonna lose after the upset against Gen G, but here they are with a 2-0 week, Rolling in to that top five and much like Weibo, lower on this list, top esports, just next on the schedule, waiting for them to get back on the rift. Only played four series so far, so still need a lot more uh, games out of them to get some fully accurate judging. BLG and JDG switching spots this week. Obviously, as we alluded to, Billy Billy dropping that game to IG. Uh, it was a bit of a dud on the day post Lunar New Year, somewhat expected. Yeah, I think this was certainly one catching yourself behind the eight ball was the way it felt for the squad. And it was certainly one where you got to be looking at what was going on from IG because I think IG rised, rose up to the occasion on the day. And I think it was BLG going down, slumping it down in their performance individually. As alongside JDG, they do have their big game three victory to make sure that they are the one taking their series uh, through. And you gotta be rolling with JDG ahead of BLG. Even if, it's, if we're still looking, stacking these squads together and feeling the power that Knight can bring to that mid lane, the consistency that this JDG squad is feeling with someone like Yagao, you gotta be giving the credit over there. And listen, JDG still now the only undefeated team on this list, but it, it's leaps and years from what we saw out of them in 2023. As you mentioned, three games needed against LGD haven't been the cleanest games across the board, so not feeling nearly as confident in this team as we did last year. And even individually, when you're looking at that team and you're looking at a player, a superstar player like Ruler, I'm not getting the same vibes from Ruler that I got last year or even the year before that when we were starting to talk about him really entering that picture as one of the not only the top ADCs but the top player period in the game of League of Legends not quite getting that aura from him need to see that superstar power rise up to that type of level if we're going to be considering JDG alongside these other elite teams in this VIP of the top five. We'll say Flandre has been better than advertised so far in this year. I know he's only played a couple different champions, but hey, that's just the top lane meta right now is that AA Trox, Udyr, different tanks going around. But Flandre, a year off from the pro scene and has not missed a beat in his return with JDG. The big change on this list is, of course, Genji drops a game and T1 wastes absolutely no time coming back for that top spot. And listen, T1... No other team from a game-to-game -game basis, I'm going, oh my god, 
Zeus is the best player in the world. He is unstoppable. And then next game, Kyria locks in Ezreal support. And I'm going, oh my God, Kyria is the best player in the world right now. T1 is absolutely looking unstoppable. Uh, you heard what you were talking about earlier when we were talking about Doc Dom and, you know, just how easy it is locking the Korean Ezreal. Yeah. He says it doesn't matter if it's ADC or support. Lock in that Korean Ezreal and we're finding a way through. T1 regained top spot at the power rankings for us here at this point in time. And it really has been a journey for them to this point. As you mentioned, Gen G having that slip up to KT, playing a factor into allowing this window of opportunity for T1 to continue to impress and take that top spot at the top of the power rankings. You, you, what do you want from this team? You're, as we already talked about, Ezreal support, it doesn't matter. They're still calm, cool, collected, going through the game and making sure they're getting out in front, even with, you know, a little bit of a, a slip of, I'd say, early game against DRX with that one. They still find a way to close through the series. I mean, it's it's five straight series that they've won in 2-0 fashion. They haven't dropped a game since matching up against KT way back in late January. And it's multiple games. You've seen them down, what was it, 7-0, 6-1 in kills. And it's either almost an even game or they're at a barely disadvantage and then they find a single team fight and not only do they win these fights more often than not it's a five for zero clean ace yeah that's what happened in this drx series there's absolutely a point in time where you're like okay the kill advantage is certainly in favor of drx the gold not nearly as much but then the team fight comes through and it is that clean ace for t1 and then everything else goes just like planned for them and even if the drafts aren't just as planned. The Ezreal seemingly kind of was planned, but let me just say earlier, they had some miscommunication about locking in the Senna early. Zeus getting on that one and Gumi Yusi giving the nice supporting fighting. We're going to we're fighting. We're fighting this one. We're going to make it. It's okay. No problem for the squad. And it has been no problems outside of KT Rolster for T1 as they claim the top spot in the power rankings. And as we expected, it's really that sweet spot where Kyria, not just the Ezreal, he also had the Nico in that other game. He's fully able online to cook and Zeus I mean his champions are right up in the meta I, I'm putting Zeus and Kyria one two best players on the planet right now I'm right there with you this team has been so incredible and it's one of these things where even going through this type of situation regular games in the LCK you know one game you're looking at best of three series it's really hard to find a way for any of these other squads to get that argument that they'll take the best of five because of the depth in drafting that T1 has shown them to have, and then the mastery of how to manipulate and utilize that draft from Coach Tom and the rest of the T1 staff. All that said, let's chalk it up to a finals loss to Gen G in the spring split. That's just how the script writers do it in the LCK. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.